Mick has arrived? Yeah, you're Mick. Mick. I, I, what? What's going on? Is so this a Gen X thing? What's is this, yeah. a, is this a Gen X thing? What is this? Like what just to get that out of the, the way. The Rolling Stones? No. Oh, Michael Jagger. I'm <laughs> excuse me, I'm, Michael. My, my <laughs> that's a. Are you actually making a Mick Jagger reference? That's so weird. Yeah, I think that I mean, just happened. That's not even a Gen X reference. That's a, Isn't that a boomer that's thing? A total like, boomer thing. Look, yeah. I'm trying to appeal across generations here. I feel like we've been too Zoomer recently. Mm. Hey, okay. 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 We need our, we need our okay. demographic to skew older. That's the, look. I'm looking at the stats. Listen, okay. we're just, just running the numbers. Um, and too many youths. I, uh, today's been brought to you by Propecia. Start your doctor <laughs> between. Uh, we can just have like pharmaceutical ads. I guess as Propecia is not. Ryan, didn't ahead. you read the comments today? This is not the podcast we put ads on. It's the other podcast. Uh, we put it ads is, on. I, it's true. I know. I know. It's, it's the other podcast. Uh, but would I, I still don't know if like this is just a commitment to the bit. Adam, or if you were actually referring to me as Mick, is that is this where I we was one hundred percent? Not only okay. was I referring to you as Mick, I have referred to you as Mick as Mick. Oh my God, in this context, oh many no. times. Yeah. No, there is, as they say, there is always a chat that includes everyone except for yourself, and in which in which you are talked about, and in that, like clearly this in this chat, like I, I am known as Mick. It, uh, is, it's mostly so a wait, chat with between me and nobody else. So who's Keith like Richards? A, well, I mean, there's so I'm many Keith Richards. Questions. Jeez, do I have to oh, draw okay. a picture? All right, all right, Come all right, on, right. why do why do you think I've been wearing all that uh, shit on my head? <laughs> Walking around I, I, with I, your I, arms I, in front of you a little bit. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if good. you're Keith Richards, I do kind of want you to draw draw a picture. Can you give can <laughs> can you get like Mid Journey or Dally on you as Keith Richards? <laughs> no, a, you as Keith Richards drawing you as Keith Richards. Yeah, I think. Oh, oh there we go. Very very yeah. very meta. Uh, all right. Well, look. Yeah, I guess. I guess Mick is here. I, I still feel extremely uncomfortable, but um, here we go. Uh, welcome, everybody. It has my, is my audio okay? Is this sound good? Sounding good. Sound good. Hey, professional yeah, podcast the, quality audio. The, the professional yes. quality audio. And you did, the, the, you did the, you did the voice check. slight intonation that happens at the start of the episode with the hello thing. So I think it's all. Hello. It's all. <laughs> is that, is that what you're talking about? That's the, yeah, that's the one. Okay. I, 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 is this retribution for me pointing out that you, when you say good meeting, you are indicating that it's time for everyone to leave? Is that what this is about? Uh, a little bit. It's fine. Good, good, good podcast. <laughs> good podcast. All right. Well, that's <laughs> it, folks. Um, all right. Well, we are here. Uh, actually, so I, before we get into Helios, um, I am actually reading a, um, so Adam, I, I read High Noon. Which oh, we, nice. we talked about before. Right. And we, we talk, you talked about the books in the box episode. Uh, you gave or regifted to me for my birthday, re-gifted, depending yes. on what's per- perspective. As long as you're comfortable with that, um, the and then that book refers to another book about the early history of sun called Sunburst. Apparently, you cannot write a book about sun without making a sun pun. And I don't know if you saw this one. They only made like one reference to it in High Noon, and this is a book written in 1990, and it's huh. it's it's really quite good. It's it's interesting. Oh. I mean, it goes into uh, so it covers those early years um and it's fascinating you know we kind of decried the, the lack of an early history of sun and uh this one's got a, got a lot of good stuff on it and in particular there is a lot of good early unix history and why in kind of the the unix wars and why it was such a big deal that you know, sun was all in on unix obviously and this is kind of before the, before the rise of Windows as a server alternative, so this is really the the Unix wars are strictly the 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 Unice, the proprietary Unices, all fighting among themselves and then kind of fighting VMS. But it's uh, it felt very timely because we um, talking about the operating system that comes with the computer, um, and it's a big deal. So and and it was a big deal then, and they, so they talk about the AT and T deal a lot. Where the, and I mean the the very ill conceived AT and T deal, which is really um, where SunOS 4.x um, becomes it, it is thrown into a with a particle accelerator and collided with uh, SVR4 to generate what becomes SOAS 2.x, which is pretty interesting. So, which they call nice. well, S- System Five Release 5.0 is what Bill Joy calls it in this book. Huh. Nice. Well, uh, uh, my birthday is coming up in six months or so. If you need to regift it, 
Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, that's that's uh, that's an excellent suggestion. I think I might I might actually have to regift it. I might have to Perfect. to uh, regift. It. Well, and it's this is one of these. Uh, it's a library copy. How do you feel yes. about when you're reading these library copies? Do you feel that you are an accessory to a crime, or do you feel no, that you I, are engaged I in like the upcycling of our precious literature? I think there's a little upcycling, and for these kinds of books, actually, I feel like there is a sad. Like there's a, you know, there's a person in the back office of the library who has thought, you know, this high noon book or sunburst, like people are going to love this thing. People are going to love I'm gonna this. Order this one's going to go. Two this copies. one's going to go. Right. Yeah. We're going to order two copies. Like, it, and yeah. And you look at like the, you know, the, the, the stamps in the back of the book it's and it's like stamps. never checked out. Nobody <laughs> has ever read this thing. And you know, it's, it, it's either me or the short leg of somebody's coffee table. Somewhere. I was just going to say, it's like not even really fit for a monitor stand, unfortunately. Like the, the, just the geometry is wrong for a monitor stand. <laughs> These poor books and they end up, they end up here. Um, all right. Well, yeah, that's a good idea. That is, it's a good, good regifting idea from, uh, from Jack from the library. Um, so we opened up Helios over the weekend, something we'd been actually meaning to do for quite some time. Josh, were you surprised? Yes, I suppose, really. Years. <laughs> what do you think was. about it? Were you at all surprised when this became the top story on Hacker News today? And by the way, one that is like, totally surprised. I only found out this? about that afterwards, like later. Yeah, that's for the best. Know. There were already a hundred comments. Yeah, I. I, I said I this earlier, Brian, that. but a thing I wanted to get off my chest is I've been responding to people who've been asking on places like Hacker News about it, open sourcing and being like, yeah, I, I also think it should be open sourced. I should like ping the appropriate people and see what we can do to get that done and then have not done any of that over the last couple months. And then today <laughs> I'll just open source it. So I was like, oh my God, I didn't even do anything. But also right. like Everyone's I've been saying like, that, but wow. I had nothing to do with this whatsoever. I did zero work. No, uh, don't worry. Though, like, good to his people. Word. People, other people, other than you, have remembered to ask me, and then I have also not done anything about it. So, like, it's well, and it's just one of these dragging things, on and, a bit. Yeah, it's dragging on a bit, and and for good reason, right? I mean, the just to be clear, like, there's nothing. This was not like hand wringing over the top secret proprietary stuff um, in no. Helios. Um, and maybe to kind of explain why it was just a little more work than you might expect to get this thing open uh, of the of the purely of the kind of uh, it just quotidian kind of work, right? I mean, it was just a hammer swing to get this thing open just because you got to make sure that it can build when you're not in our organization and so on. Um, Josh, do you want to describe like just what Helios is? And in particular, I think it's important to clarify the relationship between Helios and Illumos and between a distribution and an operating system. Not that that's a, not that that's a lightning rod, but what is Helios, Josh? I Jesus. All right. Uh... <laughs> I'm not going to touch the operating system question. Okay, uh, I think we will. I mean, you, you, you can me to touch it for you. I will touch it. I, uh, I'll go first. <laughs> yeah, you can. <laughs> then you can. <laughs> On second thought, then you, you can bring in the, right. the supervisor bit decision. Yeah, there you go. We'll, yeah, all right. Uh, yeah, so it's a distribution of Illumos, like uh, Ubuntu is a distribution of Linux, I guess, in a sense, and then which really is. I mean, I think a distribution is just a, a whole bunch of software from a lot of different places and integrating them in some way that they can be used together without, like with orders of magnitude less work by the person who's consuming the distribution than the people that put it together to begin with. So like, you know, you'll have install media that might let you install it on a, a physical desktop or something. You might have disk images that work in VMs in the cloud or something. And you didn't have to put those together because someone has made a distribution, like a collection of source and binary software that all sort of works together already, I think is probably really the the most concrete part of it. I think it's a very uh, good definition. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's like, that's nothing new. People are doing that all the time. Like for the BSDs are a distribution. Yes. You know, the, all the different Linux distributions. Windows is a distribution of you know, itself, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, so we took Illumos, which delivers a, a kernel and a C library and hundreds of other libraries um, and a lot of core Unix system utilities like Grep. It's pretty similar to FreeBSD or, or NetBSD or OpenBSD in that regard, in that there's a lot of kernel and user land stuff and the user land stuff is both programs and libraries, and they're all kind of meant to work together. 
when I, I do think that this is a really important distinction and this is what I meant. This is maybe, this is the voltage that I, that you're, I, that I, I intended to touch, but the, that I think when people hear, if you're coming strictly from kind of a Linux perspective, a distribution is a massive engineering undertaking because Linux itself is just a kernel and you actually have a whole bunch of other decisions you need to make. There's a lot um, of owl left to draw. There's a lot of owl left to draw. Or, or that horse oh. picture, right? Where the horse, <laughs> right, totally. the horse is different oh. at both ends or whatever. A, yeah. a lot I mean, of lib owls that must be, that, <laughs> yeah. that must be integrated. Well, cause you got to figure out like, you know, which libc are you going to use? And then you need to do risk management around that. So you need to be like, okay, so now yes. we're going to like, we are going to, you know, we're going to use glibc, which would be kind of common, but people do use muscle. It's like, okay, now we're going to, we need to, uh, are we going to flip patches on that? Are we going to, how are we going to do risk management? We're going to kind of test this thing as a unit. And it's like, you're yeah, not how, how much how much harder do you want dynamic linking to be than it needs to be? Like I think is really the, the decision with the, the libcs over there a lot of the time. Right. And the importantly, because Illumos, like the BSDs, does include system libraries, does include commands, does include a whole bunch of stuff that right. is designed and is kind of risk managed as a unit. It, it is this is less bonkers than one might think. Um to, yeah. you, know, it, you it, only it, need like 10, 10 or 20 additional packages to, to really make a relatively complete base system. And, and that's, you know, and sometimes only because people expect things like bash, right. As a shell. Right. So like bash is like one of the things that you would need to, to, to get a build of together. And then a handful of things like, you know, live XML two and like a TLS library and a couple of other bits and pieces that, that, that we don't deliver out of the core operating system. We depend on uh, external packages, you know, for, right. for, for a handful of things, you know, and like if you need a, a JDK or something like, or a C compiler or whatever, like the runtime for the C compiler comes from the C compiler, not necessarily like the, that is the GCC specific parts of the runtime or whatever, like I lay it on top. Right. And so yeah. when we, I was trying to remember kind of the history of this thing, because I mean, we, I mean, and we can kind of get in, and I think it, it, I know, Steve, this is definitely a lot of folks on the Hacker News thread were definitely asking not questions about the mechanics of the distribution, but more asking broader questions about Illumos and, and what we've done there. We can kind of talk about that. But um, Josh, do you want to talk about like just the, the mechanics of Oyos and kind of when we started with that and what, you know, how, how you kind of iterated in terms, cause it is, it, it's a, it's a tough cold start program of the problem to actually build something that's, that's bootable here. Yeah. I started with, I started looking at some of the bits of open Indiana originally. Uh, I spent it, a month or two looking at that just because they had a, some aspects of their build system made a lot of sense to me and I feel like bits of it are like similar to some of the stuff that Oracle is still pushing out open source wise, which was interesting. Open Indiana another being a, another uh, distribution another, right. of, of a Lumos, a, a Debian like, uh, distribution um, original. Yeah. I think it was, uh, right. I mean, there was, I mean right, there was the intent, right? The intent, this was originally certainly was, by the late Ian Murdoch. Um, when right. It was, it was definitely meant to, well, no. So like, I mean, open Solaris, right. Was, was like that. And then open Indiana is just like the gate closed. So people were trying to do something else and it, it has many echoes, I think of the original, but it was meant to be the name, I think is an homage more than necessarily a direct continuance of, of oh, all that Indiana. stuff. But, Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. but there are many things that are similar about it certainly. And, uh, but it was, and is really, I think like the people that the, there aren't that many people that work on it and they do as much as they can, but there's so much software in it and there in always has been. Yeah. yeah. Like they have build recipes for everything, you know, like lots of many more things than we would care to ship. And I think that they struggle a bit to get around to bumping versions on things and yeah. security right. responses and stuff. And so I tried to make that work and it didn't, didn't work out that well. So we, we ended up instead looking at OmniOS. This is another distribution of Illumos, and they have an LTS release that gets supported for, I think, three or four years or something. You can see on their website, they have one of those Gantt diagrams that overlaps the LTS release schedule and stuff. Um, 
but uh, it is a much smaller body of software, which is kind of a thing that I think Theo particularly at OmniTI had set in motion, right? It was like, you know, we're just not going to have that many packages. And the OmniOS community has more packages now than they did then, but it's not like, not like hundreds of times more. So it's still not that much software to look after. And they, they do an extremely good job of security response, uh, like timely responses to CVEs and getting, you know, like new versions of OpenSSH out or whatever it is, you know, that, um, so we are based Helios in August of 2020, I guess at this point, uh, four years ago ish. The, uh, the hot days of the pandemic here. In- yeah. It was a rough time. Uh, we were, we basically, I took OmniOS would have been the LTS 38 release uh, at the time and started just, just hitting it with a hammer until it was the <laughs> right, shape right, that we right. wanted it to be. Still, it's, uh, still it stopped screaming. Yes. Yeah, right. I mean, like the, cause I, I did basically a complete build of many of the central chunks of just OmniOS, like as the OmniOS people would build it. Yeah, and I took those binaries and packages and doctored them significantly to have different versions and dependency structures a little bit here and there, and then turned that into something that would boot. And then I built on that in situ. Right, because the there's a, there is a real stuff. right. There's a real bootstrapping bootstrapping problem in that. Like there you, is, you really need to like have a build machine that's kind of prescribed, and so you really need to kind of build. You kind of have to hand build. A, a VM that can actually build this thing, and then you can actually. Uh, it's it, it was, easy it was to do that. Yeah, Helios NGVM repo, if I recall correctly, right? I mean, we made that open as well. Um, yeah, no. yeah, I think so. Yeah. That's probably okay. the way. yeah, maybe. Um, and then so we uh, and then got going with um, actually getting this thing where we could because we're trying to also and actually another thing I don't want to lose on this is because kind of in parallel around this time. Um, you and Patrick in particular are doing a lot of work to, uh, to get rust up support on a Lumos, which was going to be, we, we knew it was going to be the, obviously uh, important for us. The crate safari. The crate safari. So we went, uh, around the countryside hatching things. <laughs> I just it's have like an a, image of you in a pith helmet on your crate safari. Is that, uh, a and, little, and I mean, sometimes Patrick when you go into fiberglass. Someone's open source repository, you do feel a little bit like you are shooting at things with a primitive <laughs> right. weapon, something about it's kind of the opposite. But, yeah. It's kind of the opposite, though, right? Because you're bringing things to life, you're not killing them. So you're, you're sort of yeah, like, Yeah, that's positive. That's a safari. positive message. I like that. That's right. This <laughs> is going to live safari. forever in this zoo. I'm not, I'm, I'm really apprehending it. Um, right. And Sometimes yeah, it, it feels like getting patches into crates, though, is a little bit more like reverse osmosis, and it's not. Uh, when that it's was the long pole, can, I think, for, yeah. if I recall correctly, the long pole was getting, making sure that that crates that. A lot needed. of letter writing campaigns, yes. <laughs> a lot of letter writing. Please use my patch, sure, won't you? <laughs> I hope this patch finds you well. That's what I'm trying to do. I know. And it can be always a challenge, right? Because we're obviously a smaller community and people are like, who the hell are you? And yeah. But we but, try to do all of the work for them. And then. Yes, as much as possible. <laughs> right. It's just all you really do need to do is push the little green button, maybe, and then make a release is the other thing that then you have to like get both those done. Um, lots of people were very, very friendly. It's just that some people are extremely busy or, or honestly, like, were the maintainer of a popular crate and then disappeared from the face of the earth one way or another, like, right. regardless of why or how, uh, just uncontactable, like, for years since then. And it's been well, a challenge. Well, there's some- yeah, were there some that were to... effectively abandoned or like you, you couldn't oh, yeah. sort of hunt down? Yeah, the, like the, the time crate. FS2. No, oh, the FS2 crate is still that that person just disappeared. So it, it, it was wander around the countryside and uh, replace for... usage of that crate. Right. Oh, man. And, you know, it kind of, it, it's kind of interesting because I, I, I think, and Josh, just to your point, just so we don't get like, over, I mean, there were challenges obviously and that's what you focus on because everything else is pretty smooth i mean i felt like relative to some other at least language communities we've seen that people were broadly pretty receptive and oh yeah i don't think i've ever had to fight anyone to get anything in right like i, I don't think anyone's ever been like what fucking operating system is that that you're talking about get, <laughs> right, would, like right. get out like 
Right. No one, Which, certainly no one has created a second class tier of ports to put us in specifically, like, or anything right. like that. None of that. Right. Uh, none of that has occurred. Uh, and I do think that, like, if you've got a project, whether it's in Rust or something else, and you've got someone who is coming in from a small system and has done the work to support said small system and is not looking for anything from you to support said small system, I do think it's kind of revealing of uh, of one's character about how you treat that system. And we have, we, we, it's not, we've seen, there has been shabby treatment in the universe, broadly not from the Rust ecosystem, which has been great. So I thought yeah. that that was, that was uplifting. Maybe I'm. Yeah, well, I think we did the right thing too by getting the upstream toolchain work done. Yes. First, yeah, yeah, right. First, rather than just attempting to carry patches on it ourselves, we we got the Rust project have for a long time now been building like the binary compiler that we use, the Rust C and Cargo and so on, and the Rust up binaries. Uh, first, like, uh, I mean, I don't know, second class, I guess, binaries or whatever built by the because they don't run them, they just build them in a Docker container. They're cross compiled or whatever, and then but then that's what we use to we use those official binaries, and which means that when people look at the platform matrix or whatever, they see that it's like you know it's, we're not like the second coming of BOS or something. Like <laughs> right, I love IQ, know, First of all, the platform matrix is actually uh, a. I plan on writing a blog post about this recently because I think it's interesting that the Rust project gives so many guarantees. You see tier two support and you're like, oh, that must not be that great, but it's actually like far better support than most other platforms. Right. Anyway, don't want to totally. derail that, but that's also an interesting. No, no, no. In people, terms of getting people, smaller people targets, like, like that's You got to tier two, are you going to keep climbing? And I'm like, ah, uh, no, it seems pretty good. It's well-defined, <laughs> like the, you know. Yeah. Well, and I think that, I mean, there's certain action, and Steve, we've talked about this before about like, I have never developed software for Windows before implementing in rust and you know things broadly worked um and it's it's a real testament to the abstractions that rust has which is this is not every system like this is not, there are plenty of other systems um where you might say in a comment to note which platform some software is for go looking at you we this is any like non-specific complaint for the last 10 minutes has been about go by the way just to just for a reveal <laughs> on that I'm i just don't know what you're talking about i refuse to be <laughs> drawn right into any discussions about that yeah. uh maybe only for me then fine some um, of us have to support our friends in the go community who have been our, good our good actually community. have been very good to us in the last few yes. years so that's uh i very nothing but warm thank yous uh to them please disregard my colleague in his i am so sorry go community for my my anyway um so we getting rust up working was a big deal getting the going on the crate safari um and uh, because we knew we were going to use, uh, I mean, obviously we're going to use Rust all over the place inside of Oxide, but we also knew we we're going to use it just as like the mechanics of building the image, right? Yes, that was definitely uh, a whole thing. Um, each distribution of Illumos, like I suspect most distributions of Linux and, and so on, uh, had their own sort of strung together process for taking packages from the packaging system and laying them down, you know, in a disk image somehow and making it bootable in a particular configuration. Um, and I wanted something that was definitely like, that did those things without being particularly like chiefly composed of bash scripts and stuff. Um, right. I wanted something a little more declarative, Carter, but I also right. didn't want to use like a packer because <laughs> I just didn't. And uh, also, I feel like the thrust of things like Packer is like, well, I'm going to boot something in a machine and install it interactively a lot of the time oh, and then seal the thing up at the end. Right. Whereas I wanted to build uh, disk images that had never been booted. And, my, uh, and may never boot, depending on the, the quality of the software that's put in them. I mean, certainly, may, right. Some images may never quite get off the ground, <laughs> uh, but the ones that do, it will be like the first time that they're executing, uh, like they are pristine, essentially. Uh, I think that that's important uh, because like, I think like any process where you like, take a base image, boot it up, do a bunch of stuff in it while it's running, and then like take a snapshot. You then have to have like a process for like cleaning out the identity of the machine that it decided on, less like HK stuff, like all kinds of things, which kind of sucks. So I wanted, definitely wanted like a hermetic uh, offline build thing. So I spent right. a bunch of time on that, and and like and we 
that mechanism has grown to support both, or more than both, I guess, uh, the you know the ISO install media that we that we have that, that boots a small RAM disk to, to do the install, and it, it also the produces um, pre-installed disk images for use in virtual machines because that's really yes, like you- uh, yeah, and and then also the RAM disk images that we use in the product, so. So do you want to describe a little bit about the the kind of the model we have in the product for actually booting this? Because it is, um, it's different than other systems. And yeah. I, I, it put constraints on Helios, obviously, for sure. Yes. So we ditched all of the UEFI firmware that you would normally expect to find in a server in 2024. So there's no, <laughs> there's no like additional But Josh, firm, but firm but Josh what package. are the vulnerabilities? Can I get, can I have I, the vulnerabilities at least? I don't know if we have time. The uh, but the so we ditched all of that stuff, right? So so the the first instruction that the so that the, the AMD CPU turns on, it goes into the is it the PSP, the little management, the, the smaller CPU inside the big CPU that's like responsible for turning on the big CPU, does the DRAM training, and then vectors the CPU towards our code that lives in NOR Flash, right? It's it's NOR Flash is the little chip. The 32 right. meg thing, yeah, and then we load the uh, a small image out of that, which would ordinarily contain the BIOS or the UE5 firmware in in a, in a server, and that that less than 32 megabytes of binary stuff has to get the rest of the computer started, and so we actually put so like you know if you think about how a Linux distribution usually boots, I think these days most of the time it's a kernel and an init initial RAM disk image, like a little blob of kernel modules and configuration and stuff that, that has to select so like the, the bootloader will load those two things into memory and jump into them. We have a similar construct, ultimately. We have the, a copy of the kernel and uh, uh, effectively a CPIO archive, but like basically a RAM disk of, of sorts with a very small subset of things required to get the whole system like bootstrapped all smushed together into into that 32 meg or less image with some compression and stuff. And then a very small bootloader, uh, Foible, PHBL. It's written in Rust that sits on the front and provides the very first instructions, jumps into, locates and jumps into the, into the Illumos kernel, basically the Unix file. And then that Unix file looks, uh, that the, the program text in that binary uh, locates the, CPI archive in RAM and it's able to get like the disk driver and the PCI subsystem drivers and the ZFS kernel module and a bunch of other stuff uh, loaded. And then then we switch on, you know, PCIe and locate the NVMe device. Uh, it's an M2 form factor device that sits inside the system and contains the RAM disk image. And we didn't want to go backwards and forwards on initialization a whole bunch. So we do have yes. to put a fair amount of the operating system into the flash ROM thing. Yeah, like so the, PC, the PCIe stuff particularly is like not reversible, I think, right? So. Well, like and it, I think, we, and that was just a big kind of principle that we had is that we wanted, and, and, and other systems don't do it this way. And right. we, for, for reasons that are, that are not invalid, um, yeah, but I mean, part we, of it's Conway's law, right? Like you get the the totally. system. The system vendor provides when we're up to a contract, an interface contract point, right? Where it's like, which is like what UEFI is, and then you, the operating system vendor, provide a UEFI compliant application that the firmware will is willing to load into RAM and, and kick off. And there's a whole bunch of stuff then in that contract, both explicit and sometimes implied that initialization has to have been done in a particular way beforehand. And some of it is not always that great or that crisp or that reliably done. And so we do all of that stuff ourselves in one body of software. So it's rather than like a firmware bootloader thing made by group A and an operating system made by group B, we just have group A and they made the operating system kernel do the things that the firmware would have to have otherwise done in the in the old model. That's right. We ship it as one thing. Yeah. Well, and then and then in, importantly, like we are not seeking to so in a traditional UEFI world, 
you've got this operating system that runs before anything does this this platform layer that makes available uefi as an abstraction right. and this platform initialization layer and then it boots often a bootloader that then it does some things to go yes. find what you want to load and then it pretends that the system is freshly reset and boots an actual an operating system and we it, again, understandable why you want to be Conway's law and other things, why you'd want to have a bootloader in there, but we actually know what we want to boot. We want to boot Helios. So we actually right. don't want any of that stuff. We want to go straight from the PSP. We want to boot the operating system and boot it all the way up and not have to go backwards at all and not have to. And so the, the, the challenge of that, and there's a question in the chat of like, well, wait a minute, could you, uh, could you actually take an absolutely minimal read-only support for ZFS and load the the, the kernel? It's like, yes, we can. You could, um, you could um, it, right? You could certainly go and implement like a ZFS, a read-only ZFS. Like so, our in, in the Illumos OS itself on a PC, the bootloader has a second implementation of ZFS in it, like a, a small read-only one that is able to locate the kernel and the boot archive out of a ZFS pool on the disk that the bootloader is on using the firmware's disk drivers, uh, you know, like BIOS or, or UEFI to, to read blocks out of the disk and it has just enough code in it to parse the disk structures without like needing to write to the disk. It's all read only. And that's how that works. But that requires that you can get to the disk, which is right. one of the real, the real chicken and egg problems we had, right? Is the disk in the system we were able to build, the disk is a PCI device an NVMe device. And in order to get to the disk, to get the large quantity of data that you would need for the pool, the, the RAM disk image, uh, you would need to turn on the PCI stuff. You'd need to you know, do any attestation you were hoping to do of firmware blobs that are in the PCI path. Like, There's all kinds of work that you need to do that often you can't undo and let go of and have the operating system then do it again. Uh, cause some of these like registers, you set them or whatever. And the only way to get them back to the power on state is by powering with like power cycling the thing, which obviously is somewhat counterproductive when you're trying to get it to turn on. But the, w which is different from the PC world where, where the bootloader, well, the firmware makes promises to the bootloader about like, well, look, look, I'm going to do enough PCI that you can see all the PCI devices and they're going to be turned on. They're going to be left in some state. You know, bus mastering is probably turned on, all kinds of things. I've Maybe I've configured the IOMU or maybe I've turned it off or something. Like, you know, good luck. Here it is. <laughs> you, right. you can assume some of those things have been done correctly. You can go and redo bits and pieces sometimes, but like yeah. if you are hoping to attest the firmware of all the PCI devices before you allow them to talk to main memory, like that's not a thing necessarily that you can do. Like th there'll be a gap, right, between when the firmware maybe turn things on and when your operating system gets in and is able to like shut it off, right. it's not great. So to close all those gaps, we, we decided just, to do initialization just once. And right. because some bits are not reversible, we have to do them just once in the, in the nor flash. And then eventually we get to the disc, but, but we, we effectively like the, the files that go in the CPI archive that are in the nor flash are just a cache basically of like, or, or a copy of, of a small subset of files that are also in the pool so that we can load them before we can get to the pool basically is, is a good way to think about it. And I mean, the, because we are like space constrained there, right? Uh, it's yes. 32 megs, um, which is a lot for hubris but not as much for Illumos. <laughs> right. Although, <laughs> honestly, like we're only using about eight meg. I know. I noticed that. That's gotten, Andy's done a great job, I think. Cause has Andy been slimming that down? That's well, gotten it was smaller, already, hasn't it? It was already eight meg. <laughs> like oh, the, it was already eight megs. I'm I, sorry. Cause the, it's all right. I did that bit. <laughs> all right, I'm sorry. Um, and, and I, you know, we, I think Dan wrote the compressor or whatever, right? Like the pinprick, oh. pinprick thing. Uh, but but that is compressed. It's like a CPI archive that we then compress with some kind of deflate thing that Foible is willing to unpack. Uh, so it's like bigger before that, but but it is compressed. It's only about eight and a half megabytes, I think. And I don't expect it to grow a whole lot because, like you know, if we if we added an you know like consider OPTE is a relatively big kernel module, 
Right. OPTE being the the oxide, the the uh, packet transformation, packet transformation engine. engine that we use yeah. as the implement. Part of our software networking thing. Right. Software defined networking. Right. Uh, so like imagine if we added another feature like that, but it wasn't in the boot path. So it right. wasn't like a, it was a kernel module, but we didn't need it to get to the disk. We wouldn't put it in the in the CPI archive. So like the ROM wouldn't get bigger just because we had another kernel module. Right. It, it, it's not. And, and so you, so this is a very kind of custom thing that we've got where we are saying we are kind of uh, bifurcating the kernel modules about you. This kernel module needs to be in that, the, the nor flash. And this yeah. other one is actually, I mean, in particular, the, it's a pretty specific allow list of specific right. modules that, that we determined were required before root, the root file system was mounted in order to get it mounted. Right. And so, uh, and then we, um, um, we also don't actually execute user level processes from there, if I recall correctly. That's true. We don't create any processes until root, until way after root is mounted. So like, this is all in kernel stuff. Which I, I mean, I think it was, I don't know. I thought that was a great discovery that we could actually do all of this inside of the the, the constraints and yeah, we could that's part of why it's so small. Because like when we were trying, we we did have a swing at putting a small user land in there, and it did, it was bigger certainly. I think than the eight meg in the in the end because it like obviously it's like all the kernel stuff that you need and some additional user space programs and libraries and. Like a lot of our programs and libraries are sort of built with the expectation that they're all going to be installed and the disk is not that tight. So like, uh, you know, the, and also like our startup process is really, um, one of my goals was certainly not to like change it all necessarily if we could avoid it. Right. Fr from the way that it works on a PC, like there are things to chuck out that definitely like are counterproductive things, but there are so many parts of it that are just like inconsequential. Like, it doesn't matter that they work the way that they do, even if it's not the way that people would have necessarily picked if they'd done it from scratch. Like, it's already been done and it works. So if we can just be, like, if we can be different where it makes sense and then get to the right. point where, we, where we're not different, then I think it's, just from a maintenance perspective, it's better for everybody. And so, like, on a, on a PC, when you reboot, we create, re recreate this CPO archive, right? As a as it is a cache of things, we just like get all the kernel modules on, that you happen to have installed on the assumption that some of them will be needed to boot. And that thing can be 40, 50, 60 megs, right? Which is fine when it's on the disk, uh, just wouldn't fit in the nor flash. So we had to pare it down. Um, but but we, we produce at build time, the archive that you would normally produce on reboot after a software update where you've added some kernel modules or updated something. But it is otherwise extremely similar. Yeah, interesting. And then so the artifacts coming and because you also want to allow Helios to run on non-oxide hardware, right? Yes. I thought that it was very important that we kept providing good ways to do that because as much as I, I like the hardware that we have built, um people are going to want to do things on random piles of desktops or like, you know, we want to be able to run it on commodity servers that are co-located in the data center. Uh, you know, like, you know, if we, if we establish a point of presence somewhere far away and we don't want to put a whole oxide rack there, for instance, like we might just put two servers somewhere. Right. And at least right now we don't have a product that fits that bill. So we have to do that on commodity stuff. And I think that that would be true for quite some time. I think it's always going to be true, right? Because we, at least, because we also run Helios on the manufacturing stations. We do. Illumos on the desktop, 2024. You betcha. Good. You heard it here first. There yeah. you go. Give, give Hacker News something really get their, really get stuck in their craw. There you um, go. We, we got to get a, a, I know we talked about this on our manufacturing episode, Adam, but. Um, and I know, I think you used the image of that, right? With the, with Josh. Oh, the, the, yeah. Yeah, the, Josh's uh, station. Yeah, um, but so that thing is, and so that's running on some. I mean, ironically, I mean that's running on the kind of commodity machines we're trying to replace the shittiest but, Dell, the shittiest Dell <laughs> desktops imagine. from two thousand. One of our core values is uh, thriftiness, shitty hardware. Oh yeah, thriftiness, right? Right, right. which exactly rhymes with shitty hardware, I guess. Right. <laughs> So there, I like also because we were trying to get this stood up in the pandemic, right? So there was right. like that we were in the middle of the. I mean, we were having 
oh, oxide God. hardware supply challenges, oh, right? But, but like separate from those supply ch chain challenges, I couldn't buy like desktops <laughs> in, well, the, there was, in, there the, was in the form moment. factor and price range that I wanted to buy. So I ended up, I found that like there, there was this place in Arizona that would do off lease like Dell, Optiplex, I don't know, 700 to 900 to 90, 20, something like that. Like from about 2014 to, to 15, about that era, for like a hundred bucks shipped. And I believe and they had hundreds that, of them. <laughs> that that some have up rev firmware and some have down rev firmware. And I believe you discovered yeah. that the hard way, if I recall correctly. Yeah, there was some differences in the way the USB ports were enumerated, which is a bit sad, but the but the but they're all same rev now. <laughs> which right right yeah well we I, did, I, I mean there was some down rev for a while and then back to up rev because we fixed the rev. driver that the, and yeah i i did uh think it was i mean because you're getting helios to run on these commodity servers and commodity machines and we're also like there are machines that you bought from some aggregator in for, arizona for a hundred bucks so they're like not stolen i want to emphasize that yeah from an air conditioned rubbish bin basically i mean right yeah. not stolen because it's like it wouldn't be worth anyone's time to steal them <laughs> um, no. so like right. they, they, you would literally steal anything else around them before but stealing honestly them. like if you were a business and you had a thousand of these things on a pallet it's like actually at some point expensive to dispose of that many of them, so, so, like, of them i yes. see Right. Yeah, no, like, I mean, basically stealing them would be a, a, a benefit waste. from a tax perspective. Like, yeah. Josh, am I remembering correctly that we were a little bit constrained on the on the three by four monitor that you had selected, or am I making that up? Constrained in what sense? Like we couldn't we couldn't obtain them. Oh no, we could. That was fine. Okay. It was like there were only no no one makes them anymore. I guess. It's, I think the, the constraining you're thinking about is I ran out of them because we used them all. Ah, like the, I because I bought off lease uh, Dell like ultra ultra sharp. I think they're like 1907, 1908 FP panels, it, it also is, from the same era. They're all like contemporary uh, with one to another. Create the, to create the future of hardware, we must consume the past. We must do. We must consume your e waste and actually honestly, like the like the first monitor that I bought with my own money. Was one of those so, like? <laughs> so, it was like so a, you bought it for the nostalgic factor. To, yeah, to no, I'm like sitting in front of this thing. It's like it's it's, it's reminds me of you know being uh, not as old as I am now. Wait, you, I think I'm watching. Is this like Citizen Kane for TTYs? What is this? This is like <laughs> it. it uh, don't get that reference, but the you know yeah. Um, so yeah. the but you were and in particular though you were having to deal. With so much bias and BMC and UEFI pain. When you say bias, you mean bi well, BMC bias. Yes. He, bias. He's, he's bias. not referring okay. to his unconscious bias. No, bi good. Bias. Very good. I am All referring right. to bias pain. But there were just so many times where you're just like in this excruciating pain. I'm like, you know what, Josh, you know what we need to do? We need to start a computer company. It's the, yeah. like, I, yes, I don't. I'm trying I'm to working get at, I'm yes. working at it. I'm working at it right <laughs> now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> we I have to like, Try to be more committed to, to it. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Um, but yeah, it is extremely yeah. handy to the, that that we can have Helios and the same kind of uh, th the same distribution mechanism can create a, a a package effectively that can be dropped onto a gimlet under our, our compute sled. Then it can yeah. also be dropped. We can put that on a server. We can put that on a on our manufacturing stations. We, I mean, it's One, got a another lot of thing that I was keen to get done too is that i want to run the same binaries on all of those things as well yes, i'm not right. particularly it's, interested in rebuilding the software for every different shape so we do actually we have like a central packaging repository that contains like the current set of os packages you know and and, and all the adjunct stuff that we layer on top like shells and you know like tmux and git and all the other crap that you need to make a usable unix computer and then we our image process is, you know, a list of packages from that um, from that core repository, generally speaking, and plus some oxide specific applications like our control plane for the for the production image. But for you know workstations and manufacturing stations, different sets of packages overlaid, and then some like a finalization step where we maybe remove a bunch of things that we that, 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 though they are in the package they are not necessary and they make the image too big or something like that so there's some like a 
like an additive packaging step and then a, a um the other word subtractive subtractive that's the one <laughs> subtractive uh tr- like a trimming step where we, we remove or, or and then and then like a final like customization thing where if we want to put pre-bake some specific config files into the image that are different from the the ones that you find in the base os repository um but the same you know the same kernel and libc like the same copy of grep or whatever sits on the production system and you know in in uh, virtual machines in AWS and on people's workstation desktops that they use to develop the software and you know whatever. So I think because then right. you know you can take a core yeah. file or whatever from any of those things and like you definitely be experiencing the same. You use you're reproducing the same uh, issue or whatever in different contexts. It just it's I think it's better to have less different specific binaries than more of them floating around. Generally. Uh, totally. Well, and especially as you've got, you know, one is developing software that is kind of interacting with the surround. It's like you don't right. want, it's important that the thing that you're actually testing on is the thing that actually is going to be deployed. Um, right. And our, our Solaris heritage comes from a time when the operating system was proprietary. So there's a lot of like, they too wanted everybody to be using the same binaries for things. But then in order to make them flexible, it's very modular and configurable in many cases where uh, sometimes software that didn't start out proprietary i feel like you know the like it's like well you want it to be different you should you know enable this if def or something you know and, and build it again like or build it against a different set of libraries or whatever whereas we have a lot of uh dy- dynamic uh linking and modules and plugins and configurable stuff so it's been pretty easy to make that happen in reality it's been good um, there was a question in the chat about what uh, packaging, what, what does the package repository run? What is the actual substrate you use there? How do you actually deliver? The, what's the packaging system code? is called uh, IPS, the image packaging system, and uh, which was an artifact of the Open Solaris era at, at Sun, which, and they, I believe they also use it to deliver Oracle Solaris 11 today. But uh, the, it is a pretty late entrant to the packaging world because you think yes. about like the, yes. the other stuff like uh, RPM and YUM and de- yeah. de- Depackage and Apt like had all been around for quite a long time when IPS had rolled out in, you know, 2000 and what, five-ish, six-ish, somewhere around there probably. Uh, yeah, somewhere around Maybe there. Little, and it went, yeah. it, it, when I think it, it's this kind of like funny consequence because it, on the one hand, because say the now at that time you're doing with like open Solaris and Solaris before that, right. um, because that it did include everything. There was so much software that was already included. It, yes, there wasn't it, the it, you could actually have a usable system without kind of solving the packaging problem. And one of the kind of the interesting consequences of Linux only defining a kernel is that actually everyone really needed to solve the packaging problem, and you got some very good kind of competition in these different packaging ecosystems and i think that would it really because there was indisputably packaging was the very far ahead on linux based systems than on oh, yeah. any than any other kind of system circa early 2000s so ips is coming i mean the package is i mean the sun the the and that is actually svr4 packaging svr4 packaging no, is just no awful. it's yeah, like it's totally just divorced from the SVR four stuff that came before it, which is right. The right. IPS, yeah. yeah, 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 right. The, 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 but but the in terms of like packages, the, yeah, the Solaris packages like before IPS were total it, trash, such trash. I remember in particular yes. the the bug, I guess, that we fixed where yes. you couldn't R minus RF slash was a consequence of like if you ran the packaging script just like and didn't specify certain things it would start chewing away on all of your data trying to delete everything like it, it was these were yeah, not great well, so tools. that the thing that you're talking about right is is a part of the problem with the classic approach to packaging that ips did away with to uh mixed reactions i guess i i am hugely in favor of it but i understand that it is a change that it represents like a change to the way people have to think about packaging uh but the spr for packaging and and i th- i assume like dpackage and 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 rpm and stuff like allow you to like 
lay down a bunch of files, but then like maybe you need to do something after that, like right. you know, run some program to add a user or a group or something or reconfigure something or ch- you know, change something other than just a flat file that you happen to be delivering in order to make the thing usable. And so that you know, you, you would have these post install scripts oh, ultimately God. delivered yeah. in the package, but in they the had to be that. able to run in several different contexts. Yeah. One of which was on the live system, another one of which is like not on the live system in, you know, like assembling an alternate route or whatever, like we would do during an image creation, right? Right. Like I'm, I actually want to create a system over here in a directory. Please don't touch the running system. Uh, but like you've got root <laughs> in the post install script. Good luck, like preventing them from doing the wrong thing and definitely like removing files altering shit in the you know in slash instead of slash a or wherever the image happened to be mounted like uh very common with post and soul script so ips is ips is like no i will not allow them in the house uh instead we will provide a number of uh more like declarative actions so like oh you need a user account with this name and this user id we'll do that for you just tell us what it is right and groups and profiles and uh, role-based access control and driver definitions was another classic one, right? If you you had a package with a driver in it, you needed to go and run, add DRV and a bunch of other stuff. Like, no, we will do that for you. Give us the metadata. And, you know, there are like, I don't know, five or 10 or 15 things like that. Basically, they did a survey, I think, of all of the common post install scripts they could find and made declarative versions of all the things that they were doing that were reasonable and then banned the idea of post install scripts altogether. If you need to have behavior that occurs, you need to deliver a service that runs on the system. And then that service is just like any other service, right? It runs in exactly one context, which is once the system is booted at the appropriate point in startup with the appropriate set of privileges and stuff. So that's the, that as a core, I feel like that's the core value prop of IPS really that and its strong interaction with boot archives and stuff pretty good like not boot, boot environments like the snapshot right stuff yeah, like be, being able to be Adam, yeah. like if you need to inst- update the kernel or, or something then we will make a, a clone effectively of the current ZFS data set the system is booted from and uh, alter the clone and then you reboot into it rather than doctor the files in place and hopefully you don't get interrupted halfway through and the system is unbootable or whatever. And that's been pretty good. I feel like updates are a lot. You can just tell someone to update and not expect that their computer will break necessarily. It's it, been pretty it, good. It, it is been pretty good. I got to say, cause I have actually, I mean, maybe this is a little bit ridiculous, but because that work got started Adam, when you and I headed off to Fishworks. Yeah. So we, we were at sun, but we were not, we were kind of, Doing, building an appliance, doing our own thing, and then and then it was a joint where I was using package source, and there are a lot of you know there are a lot of advantages of package source too. But I just I had not really used IPS before Helios, Josh, and yeah, it's like I had to you know we we had a big flag day where build systems all had to be upgraded, and that's the kind of thing where you're like, okay, oh god, you know, like I can basically right. this, this is this is more or less I'll be lucky if this only nukes my day. This is gonna right. be. I guess we're and, spending March doing that then. Right. Like yeah. Mar- March is update the build server month. And it right. was really it was super smooth. It was great. I feel it like we hardest. got that done in a couple of days. And really like the hardest problem was remembering to do the handful of things that people don't normally update or use at all. Uh yeah, I mean it was very tight. And I, I when I've had to, to update that stuff and it was just it was great. I mean it was really it was a great user experience. Um I, and I think cr- critically also like we we don't use it on this on the product system like yes we, like yes. we use I, this yeah. on workstations and, and manufacturing line systems things that need things that are like treated as classic immutable sorry classic like mutable install to disk unix systems yes. and then for the product we use ips as a build time step just to assemble the ram disk and then the ram disk is like a sealed entity Every time you boot it, it's the same, which is which has other good properties for the, the actual oxide sled as a sort of an appliance. Yeah, when I think it just in general, because I know this is definitely a point of confusion in the Hacker News comments today, that the uh, I, Helios itself is not 
user visible in the oxide rack. It is an implementation right. detail of the rack. And it's really and, not meant for you users, to be honest. Like even even though we have open sourced it because we want people to be able to uh replicate what we've done, you know, we want to give people the um the open source promise of like, you know, you buy this bunch of hardware and you get uh upset at oxide in the future, like well you can still have the software. Like it's out there. Go support it yourself. Like, I mean that you know, that's the I feel like that's the core promise of open source ultimately from a business perspective. Like but the Oh, what was I saying? We, I, but we, yeah, we're not. In fact, we we've opened it. But yeah, I mean, we've opened all right. It but it's not. Much, it's not. I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't think of it as being. We're not super interested in making it a good Unix distribution for people to install on computers and use for web service and stuff. Like, if unless you want you're that, a manufacturing station, if you're a manufacturing right. station, get in touch. <laughs> yes, if you we do support <laughs> manufacturing stations and build servers. We do. They have a I mean, if union, you have a so. four by three monitor, I can't emphasize this enough. If, yeah. if you have a actually will work on, I know, you know, I know, do you I know, know, you know, the giant fucking clock thing that sits in the corner is also the, is, is that, I, that's right. I did not know that. That's a Lumos on the, on the, the wall. A the Lumos world's running most clock. expensive bedside clock at, yeah, that, it's, it's, it's one great. of those. Someone it's, at some point had one of those the, Dell monitors that's like eight feet wide, five units wide instead of three <laughs> units wide or whatever. And like it sat on the desk for a long time and then someone mounted it on the wall and it was never clear to me what it was on the wall for. But in the end, it's like, actually, it's a really good place to put a clock. We don't have a clock. A, I can never tell what time it is in clock. the office. Yes. Yeah, so, we're going to have to. Uh, uh, there's a little RAM disk booted. Uh, like a it's it's a Dell Wise thirty forty thin client terminal that the SD card doesn't work in, but I boot it from a RAM disk on a USB stick or something, and then it just runs a Rust program that poops all over the frame buffer at the time. That is great. We have our Helios and Rust powered clock in the office. Yeah. The world's weirdest clock, and probably <laughs> and like and like not exactly. I mean, only only. Uh, Thrifty for us because the monitor was otherwise not going to be used, but and it was already I, on the wall, so it's like it's already on the wall, right? It'd yeah, take it me more was, time to get it down than to to put a clock on right. it. So that's yeah, the clock is is very useful. Uh, I, I guess like I, it. yeah. it, it's a very it's a very large digital clock, which has been. But, I know. So if I you, not know if that you look at Helios and you'd like to use it for something in production, it is in many respects extremely similar to OmniOS LTS, the latest LTS release. So like. OmniOS LTS is probably what I would recommend. Certainly, we use OmniOS LTS to deliver like web facing things, you know, because uh, their package set is slightly larger and um, sometimes it's good to not have to look after the distribution that you use for critical things. <laughs> right. Because <Yourself. Well>, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you're busy looking after a distribution other people are using for critical things. Like the, right. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so in, in terms of these kind of, or so I mean, leveraging IPS, um, leveraging uh, OmniOS for sure, uh, yeah. leveraging um, Illumos, Illumos upstream. I do think that when um, I just on the Illumos point, we can, we can talk in more depth if people are curious, but um, I, I do think that that one thing I did want to call out is the, in addition to us, like really focusing on getting, making sure Rust up work there. Um, I, I think the, the other thing that we learned the hard way from the uh, SmartOS days, um, which is another uh, downstream effectively distro of Illumos, uh, we tried to upstream things, but we weren't necessarily fanatical about it. And it, right. it, it created its, boy, if you're not fanatical about it, it really accumulates quickly. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, it's like a snowball, right? Like It is. If you're not melting it, it just keeps getting bigger and like it accretes. It, it and, accretes. And, 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 and the second you get like one significant thing, and we had a couple of these, Patrick, I was like, I think a couple of these kind of come to mind. We had a couple of things that we had decided like, ah, we're not going to upstream this. It's like, it's just for a variety of reasons that we're not like necessarily good. It was more like, this is just not ready to be upstreamed or, it's just, or it's not it sufficiently general or, it's not or, specifically general. You know, it's really kind of specific to us. And, and if if these things are like are creating a lot of diff traffic, it just becomes really really easy for the stuff to accrete. And so, one thing that we've really tried to to be uh, strict about is be getting stuff. I mean, we get a lot of stuff goes upstream like 
just flat out first. Um, yeah. And we we are um, st- so we. I know Patrick. Patrick is. Uh, you guys push up a lot. Almost all of the Beehive Delta straight up, right? I mean, I feel yeah, like all, all all of that goes straight in. There's it never touches St. Louis first. Right. So we actually pull it back into our f- pull downstream back in. fork. Yeah when we merge everything that's in, in the upstream fork each, you know, a day or a week or what, however often we do that. Well, and I, I, I also think, which is also important is that then we also, in part, because we are going upstream first, like we stay really, really current. Yes. And, uh, it, the, <laughs> it's just Adam, so much I, easier. <laughs> oh my God. Well, but Adam, you and I lived this at Fishworks, it, where at the time, so we are banking an appliance. I mean, not not wholly dissimilar to what we're doing at Oxide, making an appliance based on Solaris, and it, and but not doing it, you know, doing as well in many different dimensions. But one of the there is this any more there was much more churn in the operating system. And Adam, do you remember syncing up? I mean, it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal, and we got broken all the time. And we would yeah. get broken really, really badly by upstream in How ways. In particular, did you, did you merge? Uh, the, the, well, as this was like frequently as possible. I don't know. Well, like, no, well, no. But the, the, this was like this terrible balancing act because you know, yeah. of course, right? Yeah. It's like. It's like very painful. So I don't want like. How often do I want to go to the dentist? Like I don't know. Not every day. Uh, yeah. You know. And so, but then you. So of course, great. It's like you are deferring that pain. And then when you do go to sync up, I remember we had a, another piece of software that was very much developed at cross purposes to ours, and uh, it just deleted all of our software. So uh, <laughs> the, it, it deleted all of, in particular, more concretely, it deleted all of our SMF manifests. So uh, it was just like, you have no services. And you're like, I... I, but it, I did have it, services. <laughs> because it didn't recognize them. It's like, I don't know who this is. I'm deleting it. And we're like, but hi, it's like we're a user of the system. And it was, and I just feel like there were so many of those Adam where it would just take, I mean, it would take a, I mean, the fact that I can still remember build 135, uh, build 135 <laughs> was, was, was a, hey, you know, I, okay. The, the, am I, am I, I know I'm not in a safe space. I just remember, I remember the day I was debugging that and just being like so. God, it was so frustrating. And it's just really, really frustrating. Getting broken by upstream is something that like really chips away at your soul because it feels like there's just this giant leak at the bottom of the bucket. And it feels very, you know what I mean? Maybe this is just me. It feels very despairing to to be broken by upstream. Um, because you're part, like, like part of it's like you're being broken by things that you don't really have particularly intimate knowledge of. And it's like, I just, this was a thing that worked yesterday. Hey, that's that's right. exactly what, 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 what was the value in breaking it? Need for it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's awesome. like, of course, the value was like, well, they were trying to, you know, make it better or do something, you know, but, but like, but that's not how it feels on the receiving it's like end. How it feels. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, and I also feel that like when you have a large number of people developing a body of software, you know, people think that they're adding value when they're not always bluntly or like, or the worst thing is like, no, no, no. This is the phase one of the project where we just break everything. The, the the gloriousness happens in phase five, which of course you never get to phase five because like you've been right. defunded before then. So it's like, well, this is great. We just have like, but that well, was fun. We got for a reason. That's a balancing act that we face with the Lumos all the time, right? People are like, couldn't you just make it easier for me to like thrust my change into the repository? Like, I just want to put it in there so that people can, you know, people, everybody can have it and they can see how it is. It's like, right, but. If they see how it is and it's not good, that's going to make everybody very right. sad. So, right. like, but like, we want to encourage people to have, you know, room to explore. It's just like it's a hard problem because it, it is, is the hard operating problem. system, and sometimes it's the file system, right? It's like the most crucial thing at the bottom of the stack that just like can't be broken, really, or everything's like screwed up, and so it's hard sometimes. You're like, you got to tell people. You know, like, I want to take the thing that you've made, but it's not quite ready yet. We need to test it more or something. Or you need a little more review. Or we need to, you know, make it slightly more robust or slightly more backwards compatible or something so that people don't notice when it goes in. Because that's ultimately what you want with operating system evolution, I think. You want it to do everything it did yesterday and to do marvelous new things in the future, but you don't want anyone to notice the transition between those. Well, and you also... Really want people to be able to run the latest all the time. 
And you want yes. to have people need to be fearless about running the latest because they know that like latest, it's a, my life only gets better. And yeah, you know, this is this is what you know, and this is kind of very deep roots for us because this goes back to um, some very dark days for for Sun um, when this was not necessarily the case, and it's what our, our former colleague Jeff Bonwick co coined as the the FCS the, or the rather the quality death spiral. Right. When the when you start to quality begins to slip, and as a result, people are like, oh, "I'm not going to run the latest because it burned me last time." It's like, well, now there are right. many fewer people running latest, and that that kind of that long tail of really tough problems are it's going to get less exposure. It's going to get exposure later, and now the quality of the the quality actually begins to degrade. And this well, idea of like F FCS quality all the time, you may also hear first customer ship at FCS right. quality all the time is the way we avoid the quality death spiral. So very, very important to us. I think the version of that, like the the problem that we have in the open source world, having a number of downstreams, right? Like like we have Illumos up at the top and then we have our, 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 you know, our Helios downstream. And then there are a number of storage vendors that don't talk that much about what they do, but they have downstream forks of the of the operating system and they're often really not current at all and you know like they experience this pain all the time right it's like the right. it's like you, know, you gotta merge upstream changes into your downstream every day really like as soon as they happen ideally or close to that right like you know weekly whatever it is but certainly not like every quarter that's too that's too infrequent because you're not going to notice when someone does something that doesn't work for you for starters it, like you want to notice as soon as possible after someone that does something that they thought was good and everybody thought was good and it doesn't work for you, you need to be able to sing out like ASAP. Because for starters, if we have to back it out, we only want to revert things like that just went in. So like if it <laughs> goes in and you don't notice it's completely broken for you for six or seven months, it's really hard to justify reverting it Yeah. at that point. So like then it's like, well, then we have to fix it. But now you've got to debug it because you're the only person for whom it's not working. And, you know, like also your appliance is proprietary or whatever. So like my advice to everybody, anyone doing anything like this uh, is uh, merge as soon as possible upstream changes as they arrive. And, and then that also makes it easier for you to take your changes to the operating system downstream that you have made and yeah. send them upstream yeah. because the delta between the thing you're working on and the thing up there is small. And like we have a whole tree of hardware support in St. Louis, the the UTS oxide stuff, like the oxide machine specific bits of the kernel, uh, which we intend to upstream. Like we're not upstreaming it now because it's still in flux, but like it's in the public repository. Like we don't have a secret repository where we work on it and like we occasionally expose it to the public. We just push to github basically you know everybody can see things as they're being worked on and we are developing it in such a way that when it goes upstream we don't have to fight with anybody because it's like in its own directory tree it's alongside directory. right we're not going to have to like convince people to stop doing acpi altogether in order to ourselves not use acpi uh for instance things like that so it's all aimed. It's all aimed at being one code base that everybody can use, and that we don't have to maintain patches and delta and stuff because that really sucks. Uh, did we, yeah. Yep. Did we already explain what St. Louis is? Yeah, I was going to say, Adam. Thank you. Probably not. I, I think we, you, we we spoke past a little bit. Yeah. Do you want to explain St. Louis, Josh? I you know I should have prepared for this question. It's an arch. It's a, I it's gather a new arch. is what it it's, says yeah, in the new arch. in the readme, which stands for which is really arc. Yes, right. it's, a, architecture. It, it, it's, a, it's a new architecture. So right. the, historically, there, you have the, the ISA, the instructions set architecture, and then you've got the mm -hmm. machine architecture. And these mm -hmm. are... And, for and then sometimes you have platform-specific bits as well, but uh, that's right. PCs doesn't, don't tend to have any of those differences. And for x86, there was one, effectively one machine architecture, ID6 PC. Right. And... I mean, it it says it right. And on really, the, one, and yeah. It, it is a PC. I mean, it's basically the personal computer architecture is what that was effectively enshrining. And right. in or, in order, there's a bunch of stuff there we just don't need in Oxide. And the way we did that is by having a new Oxide architecture in this St. Louis branch of Illumos. So, right, Keith, um, one of our engineers took took a copy of the i86 PC stuff, I believe, 
and and put it alongside and called it oxide and then started deleting things. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And just started ripping things out. And so we've got um and that way we you can have multiple architectures kind of side by side. So um we, right. and, lots um, of common code though, like PCI is PCI sure. pretty much wherever yep. you come from, you know, things like that. Um, want to leverage as much common code as we can. So the the um, that's been very important. I would also say that the I, part of what I actually love about this, Josh, is that it has um, really forced us. Not that we weren't doing this before, but really, uh, it's very important that we're able to contribute to upstream Illumo. So there's been a lot of effort on on making that easy. And uh, the docs on this, because I think Brian Horseman Allen in the chat. Drop the links earlier, but the would drop them again. But the links for contributing to the docs for contributing to Illumos are really good. <laughs> and um, some of that stuff was like between the tail Robert, end of the yeah. uh, Samsung trauma, <laughs> right? <laughs> and yes. at, like there were like three or four months between then and and when 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 I started here at Oxide, and I did a fair amount of like html work on on the front page thing just trying to make it look like it like it, like <laughs> like we'd done anything on it in the right. last decade uh and there are links on like illumos.org the front page has links to you know lots of different pieces of documentation that we have that are that are not like there's lots of chunks sort of here and there and and like robert spent a lot of time on the developer's guide stuff and uh I did some of the with Brian Horseman Allen and a few other people. I think I can't. Uh, we we did uh, the illmustardog slash docs stuff where we talk about like the project structure and you know like who's who's responsible for things and how to contribute and the Garrett guide and a bunch of other stuff. So trying to and you know if any people uh, want to contribute and they they find that something is missing or was hard to find, we're always happy to hear like feedback to try and make it better it's certainly our intention to make it uh as discoverable as possible and, and there's a lot of good stuff there um and yeah i think it's just your point that like that's an area where we're always looking for if if, if you do find something was was difficult um but the um definitely uh there's a pointer to the repo there and, and the docs repo and so on and i think it's that that's been actually it's been really useful just to kind of force us to do that because um, I think there are, are plenty of people who've had their first Illumos commit while at Oxide. So um, that's yeah. a good way of, of, you know, making sure that that this is a a process that people can uh, engage with easily and it, it, without too much, uh, it's not too arduous and so on. So that's yeah. been um, really terrific work. That's definitely our goal is to uh, to get as many people as possible sort of comfortable with it enough that when they eventually have something that they find that's broken they can fix it on their own or with you know some help but not like they don't need to file a bug and have someone else fix it basically which is i think something that we did at giant and you know like the sort of general thrust of like it's it's you know it's a shared responsibility all of the software and maybe you don't know that much about all of the bits that you don't work in but certainly you should feel empowered to uh, to become, you know, as experienced as you would like in something that's maybe outside of your regular swim lane and that no one else has time to fix or whatever. Like, it's 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 really all good for everybody, I think. So, XP, which I actually need to open up a a PR to more prominently link what I feel is like the the hidden jewel of the Illumos.org site, Josh. And I just dropped in the chat, but the the books link is extremely valuable. Yes, um, the books are good. Books are good. So these are, this is a basically, these are full books on various aspects of the system. Adam, it's got our, obviously the, the, the dynamic tracing guide that we did for Dtrace, but also like the, uh, if you're new to the module debugger to MDB, um, there's a, there's actually a really good book on it. Um, and a lot of terrific chapters on, on debugging memory corruption and so on. So um, and then one on running device drivers. Like there's a lot of a lot of good stuff in there. So if you're if you're new to Lumos or you are Lumos curious, that's a good uh, good source the to check source, out. The source for those books is like all available. We got those from Sun, and then have transformed and restyled and updated them over the years because they're under a, a particular open source license. So pretty great. Yeah, that that no. link is important because the those books don't come up 
in search results, which is extremely I frustrating. Know. If if you're looking yeah. for a D-trace thing that we have added, for example, you find the Solaris docs where they well, may not you, have added that thing. So, yeah. If you type Illumos into in you, this is some kind of Google thing that's occurring where we're like, it's decided that Illumos and Solaris are probably synonyms, I guess, or something. Uh, and I'm that I'm like there are, you know, GBT, the, the page rank. Have you done this, rank, Josh? No, I you, I I cast my sabo into the machine, oh. Brian. No, 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 no. So go ask ChatGPT Illumos based questions. It's gonna I don't even it's know gonna how to log you, into it anymore. Oh, you, you're, it's gonna give you such complicated feelings because it is it's like good. <laughs> it's amazing. All right, I tried to get it to write a particular limerick that I was looking for. Did try ChatGPT for, but also it was unwilling. It, and uh, and then I would also say try uh, perplexity.ai for your Illumos related searches. That's what I gotta say. Okay. Or also though, if you do use Google, if you type Illumos in in the front of the query before the thing that you would otherwise wish to be searching for, it tends to get a little get bit better. Better results. Or like, there's always the site colon Illumos.org thing. Definitely better results because it like it will constrain it to. Okay, so if you Place. if you go to perplex, I know it sounds like I'm like an investor or just maybe a shill, a free when did, shill. Yeah, when did that AI. happen? <laughs> when did I become a free shill for perplexity.ai? Well, you know, yeah, what? This is look, literally you know, a word that I've like, never heard you say until like this five podcast. Episodes ago. Okay, okay. Five five episodes ago, and yeah, I missed that like, one. Look, right. like, I'm a cheap date. Like, you buy me a ham sandwich, you got me for life, <laughs> and you know, it was good. And, and a the, Lumos ham sandwich. And a Lumos ham sandwich. So if you go if you go to perplexity.ai and search for a Lumos D-Trace, the first hit that you get, I mean, it's it get, I mean, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Like it gives you a good, good answer, and the first and it, these things are sourced, and the first source, Patrick, is the, the actual the book. That's good. It's it's good, and, you, and this is the kind of thing where it's like, and the great thing about that is like because it, it clearly it recognizes that as authoritative, and if you recognize that as authoritative, that's great at some level because there's a lot of good stuff in there. So um, I think yeah. that. This, so Adam, I, I have taken you up on your ch on your challenge that I surely can't make every single episode. <laughs> okay. it's I tie in. Yeah, exactly. Watch me. Haste, hastening um, as you are. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I know. I'm so sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, but and, and so, uh, Josh, in terms of, of the experiences with this, I mean, I think it's been just as a, because I feel like I'm like broadly a user of this. Um, yeah. I actually needed to uh I, I needed to make an extension um where we are having to change some tunables on our system um right that we i mean uh, we, we've got some tunables oh my god this is where it's like some I, a tunable that was introduced uh a bug that was arguably introduced in 1991 are you, are you sitting comfortably sort of bug yeah <laughs> Brian, you've oh, got to god. talk about some of the some of the hilarious assumptions about like what a large oh, amount of memory god. was just oh my god yeah that was just like wild the, the and this is i mean i think it's a great you know strength of the system that it has the the deep roots i i, I generally think are are a strength but boy it can be a parody of itself and uh in particular the uh we were trying to understand why we were seeing much worse performance uh of uh, the much worse io performance um kind of in the rack that we were on the bench and Matt Keeter and, and Alan and Josh, you did some just a lot of debugging to figure out what's going on. A lot of D-trays to figure out what's going on. Ultimately figuring out like, wait a minute, the arc is like been slammed to its minimum size on this. The arc is down to a, it wants to be a gigabyte on the system. It has a terabyte of memory. Like what the hell happened? And what happened is a, and the, you know, we've seen this a couple of times in the history of the system. But, you know, it feels like a good idea to make tunables scale with physical memory. Threshold you, values, critically. like Threshold like, values. Yeah, making a decision right. based on whether some observable property, like the amount of free memory that's left, is more right. or less than a threshold. And if it's less, that's we're right. going to panic and do something, like, potentially detrimental to try and save the system. If it's more, we're going to do nothing. We're going to so do nothing, like, right. So yeah. the, you get these kind of these threshold values. And... The, the the problem is that you you almost want like anytime someone is going to index anything off of a physical attribute, the amount of memory, the number of cores, you know, what have you, the number of PCIe lanes, you you kind of want to like appear to, uh, like an apparition from the future at their side and say, <laughs> what is the most ridiculous number for this right now? And they would say like, God, I don't know. Let's see. The year is 1991. What is the most ridiculous amount of DRAM I can have in the system? Like I like 64 megabytes. 
It's like, okay. <laughs> and if you're going to take a fraction of physical and you're going to indicate that as a threshold under which you're going to get extremely concerned, you should put a maximum on that threshold at whatever you feel that bonkers amount of physical memory is. And they're like, right. whatever you? your prediction is, anchor it like, whatever like your prediction. pin it to it's that. Like, who are you and, and, and what is that garb that you're wearing? And you say, I come from the year 2024 when eight, when we have a terabyte of memory on all these compute sleds. And, oh, and, and in the meantime, uh, folks in chat are asking for a terabyte and a half. So it's like not even a half. Right. That's like not even like, that's, right. yeah, exactly. Like, these like, computers had 14 megabytes, right? At this right. Time. <laughs> so, and yeah. as a result, because then we like appropriately, and Patrick, you did some great work on the reservoir. We want to reserve that memory for like a guest memory. We don't want that for the, the operating system kernel. And so we take 80% of that memory and it's like, nope, can't touch it. We're going to like, which is more than away. 800 gigabytes, like 800 away. gigabytes. <laughs> right. It's gone. Yeah. And the, and in particular, this, this ancient, ancient tunable, which had said like, listen, I think that like, and if you've consumed seven eighths of your physical memory, if you only have an eighth of memory left, that's not much. That's not much. And it's like, ah, uh, yeah, that's like 125 gigabytes, actually. Yeah. It's actually, it actually is a lot, as it turns out. And so when you have a system that, w and so the, the behavior of a system like this ends up being really odd because the, uh, like, and this is where you get to the, the, the kind of the, this, what, what's the this old house equivalent for a software system, Adam? I feel like this is what we're kind of like. I think it's like Bob Vila, and we're kind of yeah. like, all right, we're going to go into this VM system. Like, ah, oh, the whole wall comes down. Like, oh my God. Okay. Yeah. There's like bugs in here. Yeah. This was all asbestos. It's, yeah. it's full of bees. Right. It's, yeah. all, it's all full of bees and dead bees. Um, the, and in particular, the most things in the system don't react to this. But one thing that does react to it is the ARC, the, ad the adaptive replacement cache. And it's kind of like looking around being like, look, I'm basically like, I don't actually need this memory. It's a cache. So I want to be super sensitive to these various elements of the system. I want to, how much free memory do we have? And it, it looks at this threshold swap FS min free. And if the amount of free memory dips below swap FS min free, it's like, oh my God. Okay. Wait a minute. I can, I will make start shooting hostages. Like I, yeah. I will start shooting hostages. Like, don't worry. Right. I can shoot some hostages. And, uh, and so you meanwhile, system, many gigabytes of physical free memory, just sitting off in the corner. Just sitting used. there. Yeah. yeah do I do love do this. this. I love this code where there's a, there's basically an if statement that's like, if the system has more than 16 megabytes of memory, is that you? Oh, okay. Then please continue. Just <laughs> how, how, how long has it been since, been you know, that other path has been executed? We've had yeah. so many things like this, though. I, th I I would observe two things. One is that like it shouldn't have been a straight line at a minimum, right? Like it's right. like because right. you, you basically all of this thought was done in the twenty five minutes that you happen to live in the what appeared to be the linear region of the graph, right? That you're trying to express <laughs> as the as right. the scaling function, and it should have like tapered off like a smooth log thing or something, right? Like pretty soon after that, but we never did that part. And two. It's not even measuring the right thing in a lot of cases. Like, yeah, it's like, yes, you like, because it's like a complex result, I think, but like, particularly with the page out stuff, the, the amount of physical memory is not relevant in many cases. It's actually That's the right. rate of page out that is possible. Like, but other than being wrong like, in concept and in implementation, <laughs> are there other problems? <laughs> no, other than that, uh, Mrs. Lincoln, it's fine. But like, the, I mean, the, it, it just, it's like, you're worried about the system being overwhelmed by things being paged out on, on one hand, right? Cause that absorbs system resources. But, but on the other hand, if that, if we don't do that page out, aren't you going to run out of memory? Just do it. Like, and on the other hand, the thresholds, it's like, it depends on the like the, the the derivative, right? Of the value that we're otherwise looking at. And it feels like it is at best, like a proxy, measurement that we that was cheap so we just did that and it was not that complicated to think about so we instead of like looking at like the, the yeah, real problem it, is like, like what's the what's the scan rate how, how quickly can you evict pages to make room for the memory you're going to need later is really the thing that sits at the the core of a lot of these thresholds i feel like and it's just like the numbers like are nothing to do with that which is unfortunate 
No, and it's like this also just like dates back to an, you know a, a, an earlier time. This you know we talk about the kind of taxonomizing the system as right. kind of fetid, immaculate, and grimy, and these are all the grimy bits of the system. Like there is the stuff that like works well enough until it doesn't. And the thing that, that on this particular issue, and there we linked it to it in the chat, but the uh, on on this particular issue, it's like the system is like totally fine until you kind of dip below this this somewhat <laughs> magical number. Right. And then it just loses its mind. Right. And because it's a bang um, bang control thing, right? It's, it's like, a bang bang control thing. Yeah. It's like it's under like, the thing, right. we're gonna only shoot hostages. There will be no right. memory handed out to anybody. Go home. The bank is closed. Like Yeah, it was not good. It it, it was not good. And then we yeah, it, we also like in that era, it's not just like sixteen megabytes, right? It's also the uh twenty megahertz uni processor system or something yeah. as well right so it's like not just not that much memory also like incredibly slow so it's incredibly not like you can even slow. do a more complicated scheme necessarily right. than yeah. a few integers calculations here and there so it, like it is a struggle i, I understand yeah and, and it was definitely interesting to go back to like where is the origin of this because there's a comment talking about you know the ability to to boot on 16 meg systems and you're like okay this is a long long time ago and it did right. indeed it goes back to it does date back to 1991 and uh i'm sure we've got some listeners here that for whom that is older than they are um but that <laughs> is uh i i think we um Certainly have some colleagues at Oxide who would, I mean, this is an older issue than they are. So this has been around for been around for a long time. And we, we have the bug, right? The one of the original bugs from the from the uh, old system with the tiny RAM, like the the text of the sun bug in the archive, which is definitely what the like what was the, the, text the thing that we linked to right? the the Open Solaris history bug DB thing with the oh yeah the, yes exactly yes, the that ancient the, ancient the, evidence the, of the yes. systems yeah yeah no which it, it definitely is. like that and the arc history is like definitely motivates a lot of like things like getting the Helios repository open and trying to do as much of this stuff in the open as possible with the Illumos stuff and, and things like that like because you think about 25 years from now yes there's going to be so much more evidence of what was going on for like historians people, and, and no, people are going engineers to be alike. Podcast. People are going to be yeah. like, you know, they're going to be listening to, don't worry, we talked about it on a podcast and you can figure out the broken thing we did. But the, the part of, I got on, on, on this thing in particular, the swap of Min Free, because we need not that valuable. We could, we could just like tune properly upstream. There is a another value that we actually, the size of the debuff cache, we actually did want to tune differently for us than on upstream. So I need to go, you know, have our own little Etsy system. And there's a way of doing that with directors and so on. So at, Josh, this is the first time I, I've been, I've been using Helios a lot as a user of Helios and building a lot of images. Um, and I do, I love, by the way, I, it is, it, it's, it's chatty in a delightful way. I, I have to, I want to tell you that the, um, <laughs> which bit <laughs> It's just when you're building the image, it's like it oh. does not, it doesn't disappear in silence. It's it's definitely like telling you what it's doing, and it's it like has, you yeah. know, it keeps you in the loop. Before. Yeah, it keeps yeah. you in the loop. It's very nice. Um, it tells it, you it, which it, file step seventy four came from as well. It's it like important. Yeah, yeah. It, it it's it's very like I said, it's very very delightfully chatty. Um, and so, but this was kind of my first time extending it and using your declarative mechanism and. Okay, right. what is it like to say, like, you know, a file that I'm going to have here in Helios and I'm going to deliver it over in another location? It was just all it was great. Right. It was really, in this it was location really with intuitive. these permissions. Yeah. And yeah, that's, yeah. yeah it, was, it, it was really, really nice. It was fun to, fun to get into. And I mean, I think it, it's it, you've just done a, a great job. I think the developer experience has been really, uh, it's been really, I know it's been a ton of, of thankless work. <laughs> I know you've done a ton of work, Andy's done a ton of work. And, bunch of other folks obviously as well but um yeah i think that i mean from your perspective i mean are you aside from the the, the surprise of it being the top story on hacker news <laughs> today um i mean it it feels pretty vindicating of the approach i mean are the things that kind of stand out to you as as being particularly vindicating or or things that we were wrong about that we had to kind of change gears on so i think uh it was we did some important de-risking stuff really early Critically, uh, we got Cockroach and, and ClickHouse DB ported to the OS. They had only previously run on like Linux and, and maybe the Mac and maybe maybe FreeBSD in the Cockroach case. I think ClickHouse is probably more cross-platform, but um, 
I did early ports of those just so that we didn't have to like, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to evaluate doing everything that we did, but, but we'll, we'll have to run these bodies of software, like in a VM or something on right. some other operating system. Like we're able to just yeah. run them all natively. I think that was super important and all the work we did on getting rust to work really well. And, 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 and like, I mean, we talk about rust a lot, but we also, we also have done a lot of work to get go working well and other bits and pieces and tool chains and, you know, um, yeah, and see uh, Dave Pacheco's Odyssey of a Bug episode. Yes. I, I, um, Good Lord. I, Adam, I feel that now that you're numbering the episodes, I want to do like the over-under, but I, I, I've i got like, <laughs> I, I don't know, 30, 25? No, you already I'll dropped the under earlier. on 30. Well, I think yeah, we had 30 earlier. Yeah, I don't know. I'll go, I'll I was, go dig it up. I was reading back through the RFD that we worked on for quite some time like trying to decide what to do with respect to operating systems and hypervisors in the first year. And I mean, there's a lot of technical comparisons and uh, stuff in there, which are not that probably just, I mean, anyone could make a different inference, I think, from any set of facts, obviously. But I think that the, the thing I put in the conclusion, the point that I'd made, I think I have a copy of here, like the, particularly Sorry, when selecting no, an no, no. operating system, yeah that yeah. there are thousands of dimensions right on, yes. on which these choices can be evaluated and each dimension is a new question that you can ask but because we can only pick one the options are effectively mutually exclusive all of the thousands of questions ultimately have to go the same way so yes. like we're not picking a lumos because it's the best at everything that's right just the yeah. same way that like if we had picked linux it would not be the best at everything or freebsd would not be the best at everything it you know it meet a number of our needs on a certain set of axes and we felt i think at the time that we could fill in the rest basically and i do think that we've done a pretty good job for our goals specifically which might not ever be the same as anybody else's goals when they're making these decisions but like i i feel good i don't feel like we've made a decision and we're having to like <laughs> make embarrassed like look at your shoes whenever anyone you know, asks a question about it sort of in the future trying to you know pretend that we didn't make a mistake or something i think we've done i think we've done well so i i do feel no, I good about and, and, where we're at and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the rfd it came up a bit in the hacker news discussion today and yeah steve you and i were that were, were talking about this i that um i because i think we want to get rfd 26 out there actually i was going through today i'm like we gotta open Maybe. this one up and and, Today was and, me keeping on being like, oh, this RFD is closed and this RFD is closed. We have to finish right. off our open source policy RFD. And then that, I think, published that too, is like also now yeah. on my list. Yeah, we not, it, is our open source policy RFD is not? Okay, we that one was technically not moved to like accept it or whatever. Like I, I wrote most of it and then it was clear everybody was going to just do that. And so I forgot to like move it into the acceptance it into state. A I will so, say that there's like, something in the RFD that I wrote at the time was I really didn't feel like Linux were going to push too hard into the like putting rust in the kernel. And I, I will yes. say that in what has now been an intervening number of years, they have actually done much better than I expected on that front. Like, yes, they're actually I, giving it a spin and, and you know, it's, it's, it's impressive to see that. So that like, that's one thing we had in the RFD where I feel like the predicted reality has not really met. Uh, the, I would, with, I, with I agree with you on that. But, yeah. That, yeah, and I think that. But know, otherwise, RFDs, I think it's probably pretty good. Like, like you know, it is good. Yeah. I think that it, it's. Um, and I think that we we will put it out there because I think we want. Um, fortunately, um, Augustus and Ben and David Cross, a bunch of folks, um, inside of Oxide have done a great job allowing us to share RFDs on a much smaller granularity. So it's really easy for us to make that make a couple of these key ones public. Um, yeah. And Steve, Steve, we should go through certainly make the open source policy public. One, we should make the uh, the, <laughs> the RFD twenty six public. Yeah. Um, and. I, I think that it's it's helpful for people to see um, our thinking. I think that there was a, there was a little bit where uh, definitely the hacker news said today is like, well, of course you guys are doing this because like Brian told you to do it, and right. uh, yeah. and then I think which is just ridiculous. Like, it's ridiculous. I think Rain you don't tell me what politely. to do. What do you think you are, my boss? <laughs> totally. Come on, man. Honestly, yeah, Rain I did a good job as well. Yeah, yeah. I remember Rain did a good job basically being like, we kind of don't listen to him. I, I mean, you know, there is that. Was, but even setting that aside, I mean, I remember when we started, right? The, we'd just yeah. been through the ringer at Samsung. 
where they blamed us and our dumbass operating system for everything <laughs> that was wrong with the world. True. Do you remember? I mean, there was it a slide was, in a oh deck no, or something like, I you know, know. We are, oh, we, our engineers oh, are taught to feel shame when they do as badly as you have done or whatever. It's like, okay, good, good meeting. <laughs> good, good meeting. Right. <laughs> but like, you know, it, it, uh, I think we were all a little gun shy coming out of that experience. No one was feeling in a particularly like advocate sort of mood. Mm-hmm. Ev- yes. evangelical sort of like let me tell you the good news about <laughs> the dumbass operating system that is the cause of all problems like yeah well, it was, know, took a so while think, to feel confident again certainly after well, that experience well, it's kind of funny you mentioned that because i actually feel that like i felt that especially strongly i think we had made a bunch of decisions like very implicitly in the past and we wanted to be very explicit about a bunch of these big decisions because i also right. felt honestly the same way about about uh about the database decision because we kind of yes. like made the we kind of defaulted into a, a lot of Postgres without really surveying. It's not the, the worst state. default that to you be could clear. Make, this is the right? joint we. I just yeah, want to, right. just yeah, want yeah, to yeah, clarify. Yeah, totally. not an yeah. So and, we definitely and, did not want to make this, the mistake of yeah. assuming that that was the best decision, which is why we ended up with not Postgres. But yeah. Well, and we just at, wanted to like take offside, things through is. the. To take things through their paces and really explore. And I think we did, a, you know, on a bunch of these different axes on, on cockroach and the, and the database. I mean, Dave's got a terrific RFD, uh, both on the rubric there and what we explored. Ben Knacker's got a great RFD and what we explored for and how we landed on the ClickHouse decision. And yeah. I think Josh, your RFD 26 was really great on how we landed on Illumos. And it was not like, well, not people, just Illumos though. Like we also, we made that decision along two pretty different axes, right? We also were considering the hypervisor at the same time because it was going to be really hard to pick an operating system without also picking yes. a hypervisor like by default right. ultimately. So like we, we were yeah. really looking at two pretty different things and trying to rationalize both of them at the same time, which was part of why it was complicated and took a long time, I think, to it was, and commit I, and to I that think decision. It, no, and, and I think that, you know, we didn't call it out as much in that RFD, if I recall correctly, although I want to go pull it up, but the... Um, the kind of the other, uh, you know, the thing that is really important when you're, especially when you are looking at an open source project that you're going to be, um, it's going to be really core to what you're doing. You want to understand, uh, and this actually goes for any component that you're going to integrate. It's like, what are the values that I have? What are the values that it has or its community has and or right. its sponsor has? And how much do those uh, overlap? And I f- think that we, you know, I think that we feel like the values that we have and the values that rust has for example have been really great you know it's been a really good overlap and we totally. I, unlike in other lives and previous worlds we felt like we're kind of like butting heads with people because we disagree on the importance of certain things like we haven't had that happen and i feel like that's been true for um for lumos i think it's been true for, for certainly for beehive and obviously for propolis where we kind of go like, gone our own way but i, I just feeling like a lot of these things that we that's been part of our rubric and uh that's i i think that that that's been that's been right you know um yeah. and um but i particularly like the the focusing act of writing down the positives that we in the because certainly like the hack and use comments are a familiar refrain right it's like you're just picking the thing that you like <laughs> that you like right it's like you know right. actually through therapy in a number of years i am picking the thing that i like but also i like it because it's good like that's the right like I, it's not like i like it because i've picked a sporting team like i <laughs> picked a tool yeah. that i think is good at certain things and the reason i enjoy using it is because it like it, it helped like the there are many technical properties of the tool that help me do the work that i'm trying to do so yes i do like it but but there are also a number of like complex technical reasons that, that that's true. And we should explain those. And we, we owe it to, to people to at least explain why. They don't have to agree, but like we should explain our thinking. I think that's the, yeah. I think the sports team analogy is definitely accurate and I've used it myself. Uh, when thinking about like why this is sometimes a touchy question, it, yeah. it sort of feels like there's an implication that we are not sober technologists evaluating tools and choosing the right one but instead are rooting for sports teams and that's kind of like professionally a little insulting and so it's easy to get a little defensive about this um because of things like that 
uh, or that like we only know things about Illumos and not about other operating systems, right? Like right. Uh, Laura in particular was like a very big part of co- talking about this decision and she has an d- incredible depth of Linux experience. So by suggesting that like, oh, we only know and like this one thing and picked it is like also sort of low key insulting the people who, uh, you know, have a yeah. great breadth of knowledge and we have many of those people at Oxide. So I think that's uh, at least why it like gets my hackles going a little teeny It's bit. also kind of insulting you know, like on some level, like we supported guest operating systems at Giant. Like we, we were yes. running many different Linuxes and, and Windows. And we had, I mean, for God's sake, there was a company <laughs> a company that didn't end up buying anything from Giant, but it really seemed like they were going to buy something. <laughs> yes. And yes. I enthusiastically. Oh, hold on, everybody. Get out your bingo card. Because <laughs> I, I they had Josh, an old. <laughs> old system in some, uh, let's say, point of sales sort of area, I think, that, that was running on SCO Open Server. And they were running that under, I assume, VMware or whatever. And they were like, because they were, I assume, using us to uh, get a good VMware deal or whatever, like had no intention of buying anything. But they, were, but they gave us really quite a lot of technical detail about what they were not going to buy from us. And... So foolishly put our back into it. so we we supported for a, a good week there like Sco Open Server under the Giant Smart OS we, we thing. And you, uh, I think, frenetically did the work to get and yeah. going. It way worked. Deep. It definitely worked. I remember uh, when people talk about the glory of the Unix past, I would like to direct them to Sco Open Server, in which one has <laughs> to relink the kernel to change certain aspects of the IP address configuration of the machine. So, you know, it's not all great in the past, actually. Certainly there was a lot of like, you know, at some point we stopped panicking and starting returning EIO, things like that. Like, let's not, let's not think too, too well of the, <laughs> the distant I, I do uh, love era before. The, the, the Wikipedia page for open server, it's like open server, <laughs> source model, closed source. Like, <laughs> source model, none. <laughs> source model, none. It's like, what? Okay. So when we say open server, what do we actually, yeah. what is the yeah. open? Open there was that this period is... of Earth history where yes. Open VMS and Open Server and uh, Oracle's Open open systems. open systems. No, this, this is. I this remember. Is, yeah. No, th- th- this is this early history of Sun. It's about it's about the you know, open system. Open, open systems, systems right. being like no, because I told you like I've told you what the API is. It's open. That's right. It's yeah. like there's like a book and, and everything. And and yeah. there is some truth to that <laughs> actually. See, like. I mean, yeah. you think about like th- there is actually some value in sure even if yeah. you're going to deliver a proprietary component, like it having a documented API that other people can interact with and interoperate with. And like, because at the time, recall Microsoft didn't even have that. Like, it took acts of parliament in foreign countries to get them to talk about SMB. Right? I mean, basically. So anyway, I but know, yeah, and I mean, I- it just. Adam, I, 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 degrees I, see of openness. You, uh, I see you denigrating Haiku in the chat. I love Haiku as a guest. <laughs> I, I, I have so many great memories of Haiku. You know what? Haiku's got a really good kernel debugger, actually. If you need really? to do bring up of a, of a new hypervisor, like you could do worse than Haiku. Haiku is, which, because you kind of right. need a, a, something with a good kernel debugger because. I, I like things like Haiku because even though I'm not really interested in using it, right, I enjoy the, It's kind of like a all men are brothers kind of thing. It's like you too are a minority operating system that 18 other people are interested yes. in and somehow have survived 10 additional years beyond like all the while people telling you like, it's really sad that that operating system died. It's like, I'm still here. What do you I'm like? Sure come on. You can hear you right now. It's like, can you, I'm am in I invisible? Like, right. I know. God, you know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. I know. I think you always find us having a, I, I, and I think it, it has kind of given us a reverence for all systems, great and small, yes. um, because uh, there's a lot of great stuff that's out there that is, uh, we're trying, but it, as you say, I mean, just kind of the, we had to make a big decision and it's, and we made a big decision around, around Cockroach and ClickHouse and Rust and all these other things too. And when you're yeah. making a big decision, you know, building you're building our own computers it. and stuff and not having building our own computers and, oh, yeah. right. and you know, we're no got, IPMI. And, <laughs> 
the right no ipmi no acpi no uefi no four letter acronyms whatsoever actually no bias Except, uh, we just eliminated IP, all IPCC of the four letter acronyms and all the other ones that we then IPCC. invented okay, yeah fair enough yeah, there's right. that yes you you art is a four letter acronym unfortunately you, are, you know how can you come up with these so quickly this is like the you know it's you know, like a crossword brain that can go to this quickly yes all right fine we have many four letter acronyms are still <laughs> um none with a consortium that's true um but Josh, this has been this is great work. It's been as a as a user of Helios, it's been uh, I've been really excited to get this out there and to have uh be able to have this conversation. Um and I I get, I was surprised that there was um but I but I shouldn't have been because people have uh, been people waiting for it, I feel like, you know. Yeah. And it's been leaking out the side. Like you like if you you know, the package repository was available, uh obviously, because it's like again, none of it's proprietary. It's just that we we're more embarrassed about the mess in the source space than anything else. Um, <laughs> right. But the, yeah, like the, I, I personally am super excited for a future in which people who are like 22 or something, right. In some, in the, in this magical future, go on eBay and they can buy like a gimlet that fell off the back of something and they can take this software and they can put the software on it because like it's open source and they're allowed to do that. Because I mean, when I, I when I was when I was young, I had like a bunch of like awfully sun gear in my garage, right? And uh, I think that it's like you've made it as a computer company when there is a bunch of old old hardware that you made in the past that still works because you made it well, but it's really cheap because it's old and and there's a bunch of it floating around. So like that's I'm excited for that that point in our future so history. somewhere. Somewhere out there, there's <laughs> there, there's there's an infant who is currently crying to be changed. But before you right. know it, that'll be a 22 year old hipster taking a gimlet and yeah. getting it. Uh, hipsters finding a power supply out. that works and <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It'll be like 2043, and they are uh, playing this right. podcast at 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 three x, trying to find the actual bit where they get like I need the bit where they tell me how to get the archive working. Um, isn't that isn't that a glorious thing though to think about? Like that that's. Yeah, I don't know. I'm excited for that. I'm that's, excited. That's, that's, how, that's how you know you've arrived. Be like, that's right. When you're when you're uh, retro hip, it's true. <laughs> yeah, right. eBay hip, <laughs> eBay hip. Well, it's been um, Josh again. This has been awesome. Um, and Steve, thanks for uh, joining me in the Hacker News comments. You definitely you been <laughs> yeah we're in the trenches <laughs> together <laughs> once again. <laughs> Just, just when, when you think when I'm done with my were, tours of duty, there's another tour showing up. When I saw I, that there were 132 comments or whatever, I wasn't quite expecting that like 45 of them would have been from Steve, but he's doing the Steve Lord's work did, over there. No, it, he's it, it really, really good stuff. Um, and Patrick, thank you as well for for joining us. Uh, this has been a lot of fun, Adam. This has been it's been great. So thanks for uh, uh, and and I, I know you look forward to your regifted birthday present. Um, <laughs> yeah. Unburst. Yeah, and, Ascent of Sun keep, Microsystems. Uh, that's right. Good keep stuff. the pages nice and nice and tight for me. And exactly. I'll just cover over this library marking so you think I bought it new. Good meeting. Um, good meeting. Absolutely. All right. Well, we, um, I think, the, I know a, a bunch of people have asked, so look for, um, I think we want to do a deep dive on Crucible coming up soon. So, um, the, uh, stay tuned our for- Our storage service, to be clear. Our storage service um, with Alan Hansen and crew. Um, so, uh, look for that in a, in a future episode. We also want to get to, I think we've got a bunch of, uh, Patrick, I want to have you come back and talk propolis. I think we've got a bunch of things we want to talk about. So stay tuned.